Good morning, everybody. I want to introduce you to Seagal Summers, MD. Dr. Summers is a professor of the Departments of Ophthalmology and Pediatrics at the University of Minnesota in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and a director of the International Albinism Center Research Team. She is a fellow of the American Academy of Ophthalmology, a specialty fellow of the American Academy of Pediatrics section on ophthalmology, vice president of the American Association for Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus, and a member of the American Ophthalmological Society, the Minnesota Academy of Ophthalmology, and Women in Ophthalmology. Dr. Summers has received numerous honors and awards throughout her career and has been a member of NOAA's Board of Scientific Advisors since 1990. Dr. Summers' current interests include fellow, resident, and orthoptist education, clinical and surgical pediatric ophthalmology and strabismus with special interest in genetic eye diseases and research relative to the prevention and management of retinopathy of prematurity and visual function in albinism. Without further delay, I give you our featured speaker. Thank you very much. I hope I'm not going to end up putting anybody to sleep here at this hour in the morning. I know how hard it is to be in a new place with uh, kids especially and trying to get their time schedules right and get them some sleep. Um, the goal that I have today is to provide some information about um, the eye, its anatomy, structure, and then also about how it functions and how vision develops. And then also to let you know what's a little different when it comes to albinism. So we'll go over these things. If you have questions that are burning and it just doesn't make sense what I say, you can raise your hand in the middle, but otherwise we will try to hold the questions until the end. And I believe there will be plenty of time for questions then. And I love questions, so um, jot them down if you think of it during the uh, time we're going through this. First thing I wanted to do is just sort of orient you to the eyeball itself. The eyeball is sort of like the size of a ping pong ball. And when, because our lids cover most of it, you really only see the very front surface of that ping pong ball, if you will. So the eye is housed within this bony structure and um, attached to it are different things. There, these are muscles that are shown here. And there are actually six muscles that make the eye move. Well, they're all, those muscles also contribute to nystagmus, which many of you know about in albinism. Um, the front part of the eye is here is what you usually see. And it takes in the message. It takes the picture of what you see, sends it back to the retina that then sends it along this optic nerve going all the way back to the brain. So that's sort of the way things are, are oriented within the orbit. Um, this is not the best slide, I realize, because I don't think the contrast is very good. But let, this is showing just the eyeball itself. And the front part is the cornea, and the cornea is the part where you would put a contact lens, for example. And many people ask me, why can't you do an eye transplant for albinism? Because we've heard of transplants in, of the eyes. Well, what you really have heard about is a transplant of the cornea. So it's a corneal transplant. And that's been a great place to do a transplant because the cornea is crystal clear, has no blood vessels to bring in rejection, and so it actually, the cornea transplants have been great. The unfortunate part is that in albinism, there's no problem with the cornea, so you, you don't need a corneal transplant. Behind that is the iris, and here it's shown in cross-section. And so that's the colored part of your eye, whether it's blue or brown or gray or somewhere in between. In albinism, the real part where we have pigment missing is on the back surface. 
And so that back surface typically blocks out light. And if there's no pigment there, the light shines into the eye. It's reflected by the retina, which has this orangey-red color because it's got a lot of blood vessels in it. And so the light comes right back through the eye and actually shines through the iris. And that's why sometimes the eyes can look a little pink, particularly in different lightings or the way the eye is turned. It also gives you that undesired red reflex in your flash photography. So a lot of people would say, well, if you're going to photograph someone with albinism, think about not using that flash, and that's the reason. There's a jelly in the center of the eye, sort of the consistency of um, an egg white. So that's your jelly in the center. It's called the vitreous. And then the lining inside the eye is the retina. And then the retina is like the film in the camera. It takes the picture of what you see and sends it on back through the optic nerve to your brain to interpret what's being seen. And then here's the little optic nerve back here. We're going to talk, go back to talking about the retina again in a little bit, but I wanted to just give you a general orientation to the eye. What about vision development? Are, are kids born with normal vision? We know that individuals with albinism seem to be a little slower to develop their vision. And this is, these are actually pictures uh, from an individual that's done a lot in infant vision research. And this is in a normal situation. This means no other problem with the eye, certainly not albinism. And as a newborn, you see a little high contrast, black and white, but boy, it's hard to really make out very much. As time goes on, at one month of age, there's not a whole lot more. There's a little bit. By two months of age, there's a little more. And of course, it might be possible then for the individuals to smile back at you without any auditory clues. So if you just smile and don't make any sound, they can actually smile back at you sometimes. And then by three months, then OK, we're starting to get fairly good visual development. You can sort of make out what the picture's like. But you can see that even at three months of age in normal visual development, things are not crystal clear. So here we go to six months, and then finally the adult. And you can see how vision develops. Well, you know, there's a little bit more to the story than even that. And that's that if anything interferes with visual development in an eye, during the time that vision's developing, let's say, you know, a baby develops a cataract, and maybe they're two and a half years old that really can stop visual development and actually cause it to regress. Fortunately, we don't deal with cataracts in albinism, but there are some individuals that might have an eye that turns, and they may use one eye predominantly, and if the child doesn't use that other eye, it's going to regress in its visual development. So that's why this is important for us to talk about. So how about measuring vision in children? We all know that we go to the eye doctor. We're asked, do you see one or two? Which is better? That's the uh, standard line. And I see some people with glasses in the audience. So I know you've been there and done that. It's really hard to give that question to a child and ask them to give you the answer. So we have to have different ways of assessing vision in children. This is a standard chart that we use in vision testing. Of course, it's got the letters that get smaller and smaller. And it can be done in different ways. Not all charts look exactly like this. This happens to be one that we use for research purposes because it's of the way that it's organized. It's, to, it's very reliable for research. So let's um, just talk for a minute about you know, you get that number and it can be 2200, for example, if you have albinism. What in the world does 2200 mean? Well, it's written right up here that if someone has 2200 vision, they can't be any farther from the target to see it than 20 feet, where someone with normal vision could go all the way out to 200 feet 
and still see the same thing. So that's what those numbers mean. And I think they're confusing to people. And you, So it's written in your handout. And if you're at a place that doesn't have a handout, there are a few more up front. So uh, you can pick up one at the end, because these slides are basically the same ones that are on the handout. Well, I like to show this picture because it's pretty funny if we think about treating an adult as a child. And certainly, it would be really weird to um, treat a child as an adult when it comes to vision testing. And so we have to find another way, and we use these cards called the Teller Acuity Cards. Uh, Dr. Teller um, developed the cards, and they are used in a lot of practices now. And they're very interesting because they have stripes on one end of them. It may not show up real well, but these are gray with black and white stripes. And the black and white, <coughs> excuse me, the black and white stripes do get smaller and smaller. And so you start out presenting one that the child can see and keep going to a smaller one until they are unable to resolve it. And what happens is this is a, a behavioral principle. There are some other seats up here if you'd like to slip through. It's, it's not going to bother anybody. Um, it's a behavioral principle that a child would prefer to look at a pattern target than a blank target. So they will automatically shift their gaze over to the side if, of the stripes if they can resolve them. If they can't see the stripes, everything looks gray to them. So the black and white stripes just blend into gray, and they, they'll just look around. They won't look to one end of the card or the other. And then you switch it back the other way, make sure that you're, they can't see it. Go back a step, make sure they see it in order to try to find what their vision is. So this is a, called acuity card vision or grading visual acuity. They're different names. But these, this is done with the teller acuity cards. And there are norms for these cards. And you can see vision improves with age. This is newborn. And this goes up to age three. The reason it goes up to age three is that usually by age three, we're able to start getting a picture vision, or in some cases, a matching letter vision. So that's why we switch on to another type of test. Now, what happens in albinism? We had a, one study where we looked at kids at one year of age, two years of age, and three years of age, and compared to the norm. So here's the mean of the norm, and we're looking at this crosshatch bars because that's binocular vision. Um, so this is the middle of the norm, and this is where individuals with albinism fell into place. They are much farther below the mean at one year of age, getting closer at age two, age three, even closer, but certainly still below normal. And this is for a group of children that, and we're taking their average. So this is what happens if things start out a little bit slower, something that we call delayed visual maturation. This is another one of our studies. The top line is normal, OK? The, this middle line is the lower limits of normal. This line is where we had individuals plotted out with albinism. It shows you something similar to the very last slide, but just another way of looking at it. So what about these teller cards versus letters? If someone tells you that the acuity at now, with the teller cards is 2084, is that something that you're going to say, OK, my child's going to have really good vision and can probably drive? The answer is no. These are different types of vision tests. If you just think about it, when you go to the eye doctor and have your vision checked, you're checking your straight ahead vision. When the kids do the cards, it's like they have to pick up in their side vision those stripes. So just you know, physiologically, it's central versus peripheral vision. So because of that, you need to remember there are different types of vision tests. And in our studies, we found that the telecard visual acuity at age three is the one that gives a gross estimate of future letter vision. 
but the, and when you do it beyond that, it doesn't. And I think it's related to the fact that we're getting closer to the normal visions when we're in that uh, H3 group. So I think that's our best estimate. And, um, but certainly, if you want to know if the child can drive, you're going to have to wait until they're old enough to drive, number one. But you have to wait until you get a really good letter acuity in order to know. And I've also found that vision improves over time within the preschool years. That's another study that we've done. Um, we don't know exactly why that is, but for one, one reason could certainly be that their nystagmus changes over that time. So even if you got a letter vision at age six or seven, that doesn't necessarily tell you where an individual is going to be when it's time to drive. Let's go on and let's talk a little bit about how things come into focus and why we might prescribe glasses for someone that has albinism. In the nice, perfect world of, and there's probably a few of you in the audience that don't need glasses, and that's because the light rays come in, they're focused by the front of the eye, and they line up and focus right there at the back of the eye, right on the retina, so things are brought into focus. But sometimes things don't work that way and you need glasses. Fortunately, I'll show you something that'll indicate that not all of our individuals with albinism are quite as resistant as this young man in the Norman Rockwell painting. Um, first off, people ask me, how in the world can you ever measure for glasses if you can't do the standard question, which is better, one or two? You use the little instrument that's shown here. The kids do need to be dilated. And as you move that little instrument, you look through a little peephole. And you're looking at the reflex coming back from the eye, that red reflex. And you see a little line. And if that streak moves in the same direction as the way you're wiggling it, you know you add more far-sighted lenses. It's moving in the opposite direction, you add more near-sighted lenses. Until you get to the point that when you move that instrument, the retinoscope, you don't see any movement, any line movement in the eye. That's just a physical principle that brings light into focus on the retina. So that's the way we measure, and we measure premature babies, we measure, you know, a lot of people that way. In fact, you may find that to get in the right ballpark, an ophthalmologist or technician, when you're getting an exam, may pick that up and look at your eyes as a starter. So uh, that's the way we measure vis um, for the re uh, measurement for glasses in children. So we have these terms of nearsightedness, farsightedness, and astigmatism. This means that things are not brought into perfect focus like I showed you on the retina and that you have to have a lens that bends the light rays to bring things into focus on the retina. And hyperopia, farsightedness, is what children typically are. Um, the individuals we see with albinism will have often a whole lot of farsightedness, a whole lot of nearsightedness, or a whole lot of astigmatism. That's much more common in individuals with albinism than it is in the general population. Well, farsightedness should mean that you see it far, but not so well up near. But you'll tell me, well, the, my kids do just fine at near, and they're doing OK. And that's, that's if they use the focusing mechanism in their eyes. Now, if you change that to someone without albinism, there came a time in my life, in my 40s, where my focusing wasn't so good up close, and then I had to have a bifocal put into my glasses. So we all have that focusing ability, but if a child's real farsighted, they're probably not going to use the focusing ability 100% of the time they're looking. If they really want to see something, yes, automatically cranks in and they can focus. But the reason we give glasses for children with albinism is that we're not absolutely sure they know how to focus that much, and we'd rather have the glasses doing it. Um, 
nearsightedness means that you you know when I'm nearsighted I take my glasses off and you're a nice blur but I can see the the creases in my hand just fine so but when I put on my glasses then of course things come into focus and then astigmatism is something that is a, a word that often gets mixed up with another word, strabismus, we're going to talk about later. But astigmatism, I'm going to tell you a real exaggerated way of thinking about it. If you think of that front surface of the eye, the cornea, as not being like the surface of a basketball, but being more like the surface of a football, you realize that, well, we're going to have to have one power to bring things into focus if we did it this way, and another power for that football the other way. So you have to add extra correction at another axis to bring all the light into focus on the retina. So that's what astigmatism means, and it's not unusual to see a lot of astigmatism in individuals with albinism. Um, are there any questions about this before I go on? Because I think it's sometimes confusing. Yeah, sure. Okay, the question was that um, different opinions on wearing glasses and that maybe it doesn't seem like they see better with or without the glasses. And we do find that sometime. Um, I'm going to show you some data in a minute and I will tell you that in my practice when I see individuals without albinism and I expect them to have normal vision and if I give them a prescription that they don't really see better with, the kids are constantly pulling them off because if they can't see better, they'll pull them off. My experience in those with albinism is that they more often keep them on. There's not a lot we can do at this point for vision and albinism, but the one thing we can do is to bring things into focus on the retina. Realizing the retina, like the film in the camera that takes a picture, might not be taking the best picture in albinism, but it's going to take a worse picture if things aren't brought into focus there. So my tendency is to recommend them. If there's a very minimal correction, I don't give glasses for that. But that's not the norm. More often, you're going to see a lot of farsightedness, nearsightedness, and or astigmatism. So here's a study that uh, we had done looking at kids with glasses. And we found that individuals with albinism, these young kids had a compliance rate of 83%. That means you gave them glasses and they wore them. That's much higher than um, you would see in a general population. And so I have to believe they're getting some benefit, even though we may not recognize it, because to pick up a Cheerio on the floor doesn't require very good vision at all. I mean, it's really, it's uh, like 2,800 vision to pick up a Cheerio. Well, they can do that without their glasses. Um, so, and if they say are farsighted and they really focus on that crumb on the floor that requires better vision, they crank in, fo do their own focusing for farsight, they can go pick that up. But all of the time, they're not going to be cranking in that focusing. So, um, the other part of this is we looked at kids with and without their glasses, and we found that they had a significant, and this means statistically significant, improvement in the alignment of their eyes their, and their distance vision and their near vision. So this, make, this gives me data that makes me say that I like to give glasses, and I would usually prescribe them even as early as six months of age. A good fit is a very, very important. I'm sure if your glasses have ever got like, gotten like this, you know, you think, ah, something's wrong. If you have a lot of astigmatism, things are really wrong when they get out of kilter. Kids are kids, they're going to bend their glasses, they need to be durable, they're going to have to go through many adjustments. They have better glass frames now than they used to, fortunately, but um, when things get out of kilter, you got to get them fixed. They also, if you're prescribing glasses for a six-month-old baby, they're glasses that fit. 
but sometimes people will not have them, and so they will try the smallest adult frame and try to bend those temples so they get behind the ears, and they don't quite fit, so then they say, put a strap around there. You know, there are places that have glasses for kids. Seek them out, and they will help you out, because good-fitting glasses are important, right? This is our optician resident here in the room. Okay, so what about vision in albinism? Is it always down, or why do some people have better vision than others? Well, this is a very complicated question. And I'm showing you here a pedigree. There's the mom and dad represented on the top, and on the bottom is their four boys, and we do boys with squares, and we do girls with circles, so that's why the mom has a circle. Out of these kids, there were two with albinism. I didn't know that at the beginning. I saw this child, he had the typical albinism, iris transillumination, vision got, was measured at 2200 with a letter chart. And then the mom said one day, you know, my other son is nearsighted and he wants contacts. Could I just bring him in the next time, you know, I bring my child with albinism? I said, oh, sure, bring him in. And so he was nearsighted, but when I looked at his eyes, he had iris transillumination. The back of his eye looked identical to his brother. He also had albinism, but he had 20-20 vision. Now we're going to talk about death perception in a little bit, and his death perception was not perfect. So that was due to his albinism, but he did not have nystagmus. And so here we see, even within one family, you can have variable expression. And I know I've talked to some of you who have two kids with albinism, and they can, you tell me, one is more light sensitive than the other. I think one has better vision. One needs glasses, the other doesn't. So just because they both have albinism doesn't mean that they're going to be identical. And that's within a family. So then it's not surprising to think that your child may be different from your child and your child. So things may be different for each individual child. And some of the things that you hear one parent say, oh, this worked great for my child. And then you try it and you're not impressed. Well, you know, just realize that not everything is going to work for every kid. The reason that, uh, one of the reasons that a uh, child with albinism doesn't see well is that the back of their eye is not developed normally. Now, this is called the macula, this bigger part, and in the center is something called the fovea. And what happens in albinism is that area is just not developed normally. The way I can tell when I look in is that I see these extra light reflexes that define that. And you don't see any of that in this individual with albinism. And if you look more carefully at the blood vessels, they sort of come to this place and they get so skinny they stop. And in individuals with albinism, well, that's probably where it should be, but I've got a blood vessel that's growing right into that position. It, that part of the retina did not develop. We don't completely understand why it didn't, but that's, your, that's the area for your central straight ahead vision. So I'm, I'm looking at you, this is my side vision, this is what my fovea and my macula are looking at. And so that's one of the reasons that vision is reduced in albinism, and it's probably one of the reasons that our nystagmus surgery doesn't work as well in individuals with albinism as it does in individuals who have nystagmus without albinism. I'm going to show you something here that was really exciting for us, and um, it's a new technology in ophthalmology, but it's sort of like getting a CT scan of your eyes, but it's done with a sound wave test. And so, you know, they take a CT of your head and they start at one area and they go down to your brain stem and they can tell you about your ventricles and all your cortex and your brain, all that kind of stuff. Well, this is a similar way to go through the eye. So if you look at this diagram right here, it's showing an optic nerve and the blood vessels and the area in the center, that's the macula. 
And normally, the picture we get with OCT is that we see that the fovea sort of dives down there. So your retina lines the inside of the eye, it comes around, normally makes a little dip, which is very exaggerated by my hand here, and then continues around the rest of the eye. And so that little dip is what gives you that sharp central vision. There were some individuals I had with albinism that seemed to have what I call a rudimentary foveal reflex. I saw a little bit of that light reflex even though it wasn't completely normal. And so we tried to image that with OCT. Um, this was with the first generation of OCT, and um, you can imagine someone's eyes are moving, they have nystagmus, it's not very easy to do. But this is what we got in some individuals and what we would expect to see. There was no dip. All these arrows went straight across the surface of the retina, right there in the area where the fovea should be. But we had some individuals where we did see this little dip down. And um, this was really exciting because this is object, I mean, I can say I think there's a rudimentary foveal reflex, but you know, how do I really prove to you that it's there? Well, this is proof, so you can show that to a group of ophthalmologists and they understand, yes, this individual had albinism and some rudimentary foveal development. So this study was really the first um, to show that there can be some foveal development in individuals with albinism. It was correlated with better vision, which you might expect. If it looks more normal, it's probably going to function more normally. And well, I will tell you, it's much easier for me to look in an eye and see that than it is to measure with OCT. I don't recommend OCTs as part of the exam, but it was a clinical way that I could actually show what I had observed to other ophthalmologists. And the reason, there are two reasons basically that it's harder to get OCTs that are good. One is it's a flash of light in the eye. It's taking a picture. And so that's going to cause people to be light sensitive. In addition with the nystagmus, you got to just catch that point of the macula and the fovea in order to image it. So, but at least I think people are aware now that if they see someone that has a light reflex and they sort of look like they have albinism, they don't rule out albinism. They don't say, well, no, you don't really look like that. Because we know now there is a spectrum of albinism from 2020 to 2200 or worse, and also in the structure, the way things look in the back of the eye. Well, this reminds you of maybe some individuals with albinism. They like to hold things very closely in order to see them. And they actually might use the head posture there in order to see it. And this child um, tended to tilt his chin down and have his eyes up a little bit in order to really be able to see the things on the card that I was showing him in the office. So why is vision variable? Well, I've given you one reason, that some have some rudimentary foveal development, but we actually had another study, and um, we found that the individuals that had identifiable melanin pigment in the eye had better vision, too. Now, we know that albinism is all about melanin pigment being either absent or reduced. And we see that in the eye, too. So in the front of the eye and in the back of the eye, most individuals with albinism have no melanin pigment in the back of their eye. There are other types of pigment, luteal pigment, xanthophyll, other things that some people might if they're not used to knowing what they're looking for, they may say, oh yeah, there's pigment there, but that pigment doesn't count. It's the melanin pigment, and it's, it most often it's not in the retina. But there are a few individuals that I had looked at and they did have better vision. So that's another reason that vision is variable in albinism. And so this picture is the best I could get, and you are not going to be able to appreciate it. You're gonna say there's no light reflex like I showed you. This is a typical individual with albinism. There is some luteal and xanthophyll pigment here versus here, 
and that's not the pigment we're interested in. If there's a finely granular pigment that if you look with a special type of instrument, one that all ophthalmologists have, that you can see if there's melanin pigment in the back of the eye. Okay, well here's the front of the eye, and this is another um, variability that we see in albinism, and we established a grading system for the um, the iris translucency or iris transillumination. These might be terms you've heard your physician use. And so this is an individual that has no pigment on the back surface of their iris. Remember I said it's the back surface of the iris that blocks that light coming back from the retina. And so, yes, the eye looks red, in fact, the lens is right behind the iris, and you even can see the outline of the lens that's back there because there's no pigment. And we have a little pigment here in grade three, more in grade two. Grade one is a little hard for you to see because it's a bit washed out, but it's little tiny dots of pigment, uh, light coming through where we know there's deficient pigment. So where it's dark, there's pigment, where it's red or that reddish orange color, there's no pigment. And so we do things like this in our exam to grade the amount of pigment and it's important for us in some of our clinical research studies. How do you do that in a kid? And a lot of people will tell you, you can't get a kid to this type of instrument, a slit lamp. This is basically a microscope with a light. You put the room lights down, you get as small as beam possible, you move away all the stuff that can push into the child's uh, chest, and you have to be fast, but if you're fast and used to doing it, you can tell whether there's any iris transillumination. Now occasionally, even I have trouble getting kids to a slit lamp and doing things like this, but I think with practice you get better. You get things all set up ahead of time and ready to go. So this is how we look at those pictures I showed you from one to four. That's how we grade it at using this type of instrument. You know, there are some other seats for some of you who are sitting on the floor. If you'd like to come up, that would be fine. Okay, well, I think that that absence of pigment is one of the reasons that our individuals with albinism have photosensitivity or photophobia or light sensitivity. That has to be one of the reasons, but that's not the only answer. People who do research on light sensitivity know that there are a lot of things that can cause light sensitivity. It makes perfect sense to think that the pigment is a, plays a big role in albinism. I don't think it's the complete role, and we're actually in the middle of uh, doing some research on light sensitivity and albinism now and seeing if, how it correlates with the amount of pigment in the eye um, using the grading scheme that I showed you there for the iris, and we have another grading scheme for the back of the eye. So what do you do about that? Well, many of you already know this. I, I use a cap, I had a visor. The kids, if they're really light sensitive, you know, they pull that down. So if there's anything up here, they're going to run into it because they've got it pulled down so far. Sunglasses, sun clips, tinted lenses. Now, some individuals will need no filtering lenses. Others will need the darkest possible, as these two siblings have in the lower part of the photograph. If they're real light sensitive, they're going to like those that really wrap around so no light can slip in there. And a combination of a hat and very dark sunglasses that wrap around are still not enough for some individuals. They're still very light sensitive. So this is a complex question. You do the best you can. You do some trial and error, you know, working with it. And eventually, you usually come up with something that will work. Here's the grading system we have for pigment in the back of the eye. This is a normal eye here. It's got a normal amount of pigment and it's got a little macula there. And then these are different grades. And in addition, we grade the presence or absence of melanin pigment there. So basically, we're looking at luteal and xanthophyll pigment here. And our studies to date, the luteal and xanthophyll pigment just really don't relate at all to vision. There's no correlation. So it's really whether or not they have melanin pigment back there. 
How do I look at an eye? Well, you know, you put on this funny thing on your head that has a light, and then you hold a little lens and you look at it, and you can see the back of the eye, which is really cool. And um, you can determine, you know, is there a fovea? Is there any rudimentary development? What grade are you looking at? So that's what this part is. This is not always easy. We just talked about light sensitivity, and certainly this is a bright light. I turn it down as low as I can so that I can still see, and I don't stay there and study the macula. I know what I see when I first get a glimpse of it. In fact, it sort of reminds me of um, a friend of mine who likes to hunt. And he says, well, you know, what you do in kids is very similar. If you see some, you're a hunter and you see the animal and you want to shoot them, you don't sit there and study them for 30 minutes, you know. You mean your chance is lost. It's the same when examining kids. Your chance is going to be lost if you're not quick in doing what you ha are set out to do. There's another time when we might look at the parents and um, look in the back of their eye, and this is um, for mothers of individuals we think might have ocular albinism type 1, the males that have maybe more normal pigment externally, but in their eye they have all the characteristic features. And this sort of blotchiness, which at least from my angle is not showing up very well, but this sort of blotchiness is what we would see in the um, mothers of individuals with albinism, or in, in most of them, um, about 85 to 90 percent. Okay, so we've talked about structure and how it's different in albinism. We've talked some about function, vision, and such. Let's go into a few other things that we can see and, and sort of get our terms down and know what we're dealing with. Strabismus is that term that gets mixed up with the stigmatism. But remember, stigmatism is the football thing, so that's how you're going to keep it separate in your mind. Strabismus is just the eyes aren't lying up. Now, more often than not, I mean, the biggest part of my practice is strabismus, and most of my patients with strabismus do not have albinism. However, albinism, in albinism, it's very common to have strabismus. So, um, we talk about strabismus in terms of what, where are the eyes moving? Are they turning in? Are they turning out or up or down? And so, and we look to see whether it's just one eye or whether sometimes it's the right eye and sometimes the left eye. So esotropia, or we love abbreviations in ophthalmology, and so our notes look very hieroglyphic, but we'll talk about ETs and XTs and RHTs, or right hypertropia. So let's look at some pictures so you can see what all of this means. These are individuals who have strabismus. If you look at the picture on your uh, left upper here, you can see he's looking with his left eye and the right eye is turned in. So that's an esotropia. In this case, he's looking at you with his left eye, his right, this is another person, and the right eye is turned out. So that's an exotropia. This child's trying to look up. This eye goes up fine. That eye doesn't go up as well, so this is a right hypertropia, or you could call it a left hypotropia, meaning that it's down. So that's what it means. Now, these are individuals where, you know, we just look at them and you can see that, but we can also measure it with prisms. There are other individuals where their eyes look straight until you put a cover over their eye, and maybe you get the impression that this eye is going up here compared to where the other one is. So they have good control over their strabismus, and it's picked up on an eye exam by doing that cover test where you go back and forth. Or, and the little kids will often hang our hand up here and just do the cover with our thumbs so that they're not as bothered by a hand coming at them or one of those black paddles to cover the eye. Okay, so if someone has a lot of strabismus, what are we going to do about it? 
And this is the picture you saw before. You remember we talked about muscles, and there were six muscles that moved the eye. There are top and bottom muscles and inside and outside muscles. They also provide the nourishment to the front of the eye. The other two muscles are what we call oblique muscles because they go in a sort of funny position and there's another one up here and there are two of them. So if we talk about trying to fix strabismus, get the eyes in better alignment, we just do some adjusting of the muscles. The way you do that is you might take this muscle and set it back so it now is attached here instead of here. Or maybe we take a little piece out, but reattach it at the same spot. So one way to think about it is you've got a belt on, and you either loosen the belt or tighten the belt. So if an eye is turned out, you want to loosen that outside muscle so that the eye can come inward. Maybe you have an eye that turns inward, you would loosen the inside muscle to let it go out. And so in surgery, that's what's done. Um, it's the most common surgery that a pediatric ophthalmologist would do. And you hope that after an eye turns in, then it's nice and straight afterwards. Most of the time that occurs, but sometimes more than one surgery is needed. Sometimes an eye will drift again. It might be within the first year after surgery. It might be when they're 90 years old, but it can drift again, and then there might need to be another surgery. So that's what's being done in strabismus surgery, to try to adjust those muscles, get them to the eye to come back to a more straight ahead position. There's another time when we operate on eye muscles, and that's for nystagmus. Here's another one of those words that's got the ST in it, and so that gets confused with astigmatism, strabismus, and nystagmus. So nystagmus is just that uh, dancing movement of the eyes, the to and fro movement. And for those of you who have children with albinism, you know it looks like they're just scanning their world, and then things get better, and usually it doesn't make that wide excursion, it actually becomes smaller. And many people ask me, well, what are they seeing? Are they like seeing things go back and forth? The answer is no. The brain is really good at figuring that out. But it means if I'm looking at you and my eyes are doing this, only part of the time is my macula or fovea directed towards you. So um, if the eyes are moving, they don't have as long a time on the image that they're trying to focus on. And that makes sense then when we talk about delayed vision visual development in children. They don't have as much time trying to look at mom, and so it's maybe that they don't seem to see mom at that time. So individuals with albinism have nystagmus. Other people without albinism have nystagmus. Sometimes they have optic nerve problems. Sometimes they have no other problems whatsoever, and they just have nystagmus. So nystagmus is not unique to albinism. But the head posture a child can use, whether it's chin down, chin up, they can turn their head, or they can tilt their head and turn their head. They're, that's really to get the eyes in the most still position so that that nystagmus is as minimal as possible because that's going to give them better vision. There'll be a longer period of time that they can look at you and be able to recognize you. So that's the the reason for doing that, we, you know, we've I've sometimes had parents come in and they said, I've been seeing a physical therapist to get rid of this head posture, and I have to explain, don't do that. We don't. That's not a bad thing. It's a good thing when, if they have to turn their head, they're learning to see better. Now, not everyone with albinism is going to have an abnormal head posture, but if you see it, now you know why. So in order to deal with nystagmus, sometimes we don't have to do anything at all, I'd say most of the time, but you will hear about some surgeries, and I will just go through these. Um, the first one that was described, the one that we have the longest experience with, is something called a Kestenbaum procedure or Kestenbaum-Anderson procedure. And basically, it's if I have a head turn here and my eyes are over here, the horizontal muscles are adjusted to get my eyes straight where that 
null zone is or where the point is where I have the least nystagmus. That's fairly successful in turn, getting a head posture improved. It's not absolutely perfect. I mean, it's, um, we have guidelines on how much to move muscles to get the, the eyes to go straight ahead, but it doesn't always work that way. We wish that it did. So you might see a little residual head posture. And if it's just a mild head posture, you wouldn't do this type of procedure. But you're basically taking off the inside and outside muscles, adjusting their position, tightening or loosening to get the eyes to a more straight ahead position. Then in the 1990s, someone introduced a, a procedure called retroequatorial recession of the horizontal rectus muscles. So that's taking the inside and outside muscles and putting them back to the halfway point on that ping pong ball. You know, I showed you how the eyeball's like a ping pong ball, and then muscles are attached near the front. And so you set them back a little bit. Um, you set them back to the equator of the globe, and that's what's called the retroequatorial recession. So we have some experience with that. There are reports. A lot of the reports on these surgeries, they're going to be for individuals with nystagmus in general. Some of them don't even tell you how many of the individuals have albinism. Others will have nice tables where they say, this person had albinism, this one, this is where their vision changed from here to here. This is their head posture improved from here to here. So we, if you tease out that information in the literature, you'll find that vision typically improves about one line in about half of the individuals with albinism. So that's taking all the literature and the ones that we can tease out, that's what you're getting. Individuals who don't have albinism might have a better result. The reason you don't get as good a result is, well, we know about the fovea in albinism is not normal. In other individuals, it may be completely normal, and so they may have um, um, better vision after surgery than individuals with albinism. Um, so, you know, I think uh, sometimes when new procedures come out, they get hyped and, you know, people say, oh yes, that's for me and I gotta have it done. Um, but I think in, in some cases, it's better to wait a little bit and see if things have been proven and if other individuals have actually replicated the results of those studies. The last procedure is one you probably heard about yesterday for those of you that went to Dr. Hurdle's presentation and that's tenotomy and replacement. So basically, instead of adjusting the muscles, tightening or loosening them, or setting them back at the equator, you just take them off and you sew them right back where they are. Um, the idea is that it interrupts the nerves somehow that help to control the uh, nystagmus and improves things. Well, that would be the same way that these other procedures work. And we know now that we have more studies in the first two procedures and they show about one line of improvement and about half of the individuals with albinism. So, um, I think you have to be careful about early results and wait until things are proven. And, um, you know, I'll tell you just about one child in my practice that uh, the family was considering doing that surgery on the child. Child had horizontal nystagmus, so the tenotomy procedure. But that child ended up with quite a chin down head posture. And so we would need to then work on the vertical muscles and to get that chin posture up to adjust things so the null point wasn't here, but it was here. That means then if those inside and outside muscles had been previously tenotomized, and then you wanted to do the top and bottom muscles, you will have operated on all four of those muscles that bring nourishment to the front of the eye, and that is associated with a lot of problems, inflammation, cataract, blah, blah, blah. So there are a lot of issues with that. So I discourage that mom from having the surgery, um, and the reason for it is that I could see that the chin down head posture was starting. So certainly this is not something I would jump into with kids because um, their head postures are not always evident right away. Sometimes it takes time for them to develop. 
Um, Let's go on, oh, just to mention, you know, whether it's strabismus surgery or nystagmus surgery on muscles, we can't do that in an awake patient. We can't just sedate the child. It is general anesthesia. General anesthesia in a healthy child has very minimal risk, but there are some risks. So you're always balancing benefits and risks for any surgery that you consider. So just keep that in mind. We're going to touch on another point now, and that's death perception. And fine death perception is called stereovision or stereopsis. And uh, we measure it. Some of you may have seen this test in the office where you put on those polarized glasses. You look at the fly, and the fly's wings may look like they're elevated. And then you do these circles or the pictures, and, and one of them will be elevated, and you can identify it. So that's very fine death perception. And that's usually not normal in individuals with albinism. And for our testing purposes, we may not be able to measure any stereopsis at all. But I have had some patients where I can't measure any, and they've gone to the 3D movies, and they could see them. And I believe them because that's a much grosser level of stereo vision than our tests measure in the office. So keep that in mind. The other side of the coin is they may not have any stereo vision at all, and they go to 3D movies, and they're not sure why everyone else is so excited about them, because they're not seeing things jump out at them and such as that. So um, stereo vision, though, is just one part of death perception. Even if I had only one eye, I have death perception. I know the lady in red is behind you, and that's just because you're covering part of her, and you just use those clues. As I get farther out, the lighting changes, and so I use lighting cues. So there are a lot of things you can do for death perception. And so people ask me, well, if they don't have stereo vision, they can't drive, right? No, there are other ways that you have death perception, even if someone has just one eye. So um, it's not required for driving, but it's typically reduced in albinism. Um, we looked at some individuals who did have stereo vision in, um, out, that had albinism, and we found that in general they had better vision, they had more pigment in their iris, they had melanin pigment in their macula, particularly if they had fairly good stereo vision, they had some foveal development, and we had five out of the 19 with no nystagmus. So here again, we're seeing the spectrum from what's really thought of as typical getting closer to normal. So individuals without nystagmus, some foveal development, better vision. And so these are things that we've talked about in the past. And it, it helps you to realize, I think, that there's this spectrum. Okay, so the nerves, we said, go back to the brain. Where do they go to, in the brain? They go all the way to the very back of the brain where the occipital cortex is located, and that's your vision center in the brain. So the nerves have to get back there. They just don't go straight back. They go a complicated way. Some of them go straight back. Others, they'll cross over and go to the opposite side. And so one of the things that's different in albinism is like for my right eye, if I had albinism, I'd have some going back, but I'd have more that decided to switch over and go to the opposite side of my brain. And we call that excessive crossing, or some people will say excessive retinostriate crossing, basically from the retina to the striate cortex of the, that's the part that's your vision center. So this um, shows that it's um, maybe not particularly easy to see, but here we have a normal individual. You see it's about 50-50. It's about half of the optic nerve sends fibers to one side and the other side. When you get over here in albinism, it actually shows more crossing over. It's the thicker white part versus the thinner black part. So we've gone over a lot of things, and I think sometimes when you get all of this information at once, it's overwhelming, and you can't even figure out what your questions are. But I hope some of you have come up with some questions. They might be related to 
um, a child with albinism, someone you know with albinism, or you may have albinism and have some specific questions. And I'm more than happy to answer any of your questions at this time. Yes. There is the, is when you have more iris pigment, less iris translumination, but more iris pigment, is that associated with better vision? It is in part, but that, but it's a weaker association than having melanin pigment in the back of the eye. Good question, yes. His nystagmus is changing over time? Could you come up here? I'm sorry, I have a little bit of a hearing loss and I'm just not catching it. Just saying that I have a two year old son. He had nystagmus, it was more rapid when he was born, uh -huh. and two, uh, two one year. Now he's two, it's getting less and less. Okay. Very good observation, and I find parents are really good observers, and I trust what they say. And she said that her child with nystagmus uh, had um, a lot of nystagmus when he's younger. He's now two, and it's less. You just don't see it as much. That's normal. That's what we expect. So if you did a nystagmus surgery at six months of age, say, and then he was better at two years of age, you'd say, oh, that nystagmus surgery did such a good job. But here you've given me a good example to show that nystagmus changes on its own over time and gets better. So very good. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, what's the relationship between a problem with pigment and nearsightedness, farsightedness, and astigmatism? I wish I knew. Um, I do not have a good explanation for that. There, there's work that um, looks at other conditions like if you take baby chicks and you cover one eye and then at a critical time in development and then take the cover off and measure the length of their eye, they've gotten real nearsighted on the eye that's covered. So, you know, there are things that affect refractive error and we don't know why in albinism you're going to find a greater incidence of nearsightedness, farsightedness, and astigmatism. That answer is not known. You ask specifically how it affects the lens of the eye and the lens does some of our focusing. The other focusing is that front surface of the eye, the cornea. The cornea actually does a huge amount of the focusing of the eye too. Why is it different? I don't know. Yes. I have a question about um, the Okay, so her question is about her child who has some crossing of the eyes. Um, and fortunately, the child sometimes crosses one eye and sometimes the other. If they were always just one eye, you might have to patch that eye to get this one to be used. But that's actually a good sign. There are different ways of doing surgery in that situation. You might decide to weaken the inside muscle of both eyes, hopefully just enough to get the eyes straight. Another way of doing surgery is to weaken the inside muscle and tighten the outside muscle to get the eyes straight. And the answer is no. If you just decided to operate on one eye, it would not make it appear to go out. However, one of the risks of surgery is under or overcorrection. And so there is a chance of getting an overcorrection, but it wouldn't be due to the specific type of surgery done.
No. No. Mm -mm. No. is that NOAA is an organization that lets um, kids or adults with albinism to be other people with albinism. And that uh, we get to go to many exotic places and it's just awesome, especially the pool. I'm over to see my friends. Yeah, everybody and I share this with, you know, where I'm from. Only me with Not being the only albino person, like there are like so many other people and I don't feel like left out and all that stuff. I'm just gonna say like don't be ashamed to get a pose or something and like do what you need to do to um, get the pose right. Yeah. Because it'll really help. It'll really help you, and if you um, take time to do these things, you'll, you might get a head start on a uh, regular. Yeah, like go to Noah. It's like you, if you're feeling left out, go to Noah. Because I mean, there are other people who have albinism. You wouldn't feel left out. You can like share experiences. It's like, yeah. I'm just seeing other people because this is the first time I saw the people with albinism and, uh, you know, just what they're like. And, and my friends that are albino over there, I get to reconnect with them every two years. And I just like to socialize and meet other people and discuss what they're doing. I'm having a lot of fun. Um, it's pretty cool because um, my brother has albinism also, but he's 11, and I'm 14, so I wanted to, like, see people my own age. <laughs> I certainly do. There's, like, a whole bunch of people walking around. It's kind of weird, but it's kind of cool. Uh, like, me too. Like, I really want to drive, so I really want to get, like, information about that, too. And then just jobs and college and, yeah. All of you kids with albinism out there and for everybody, just want you to understand that it's a great thing. Not a disease, great thing. Yeah, people saying it's contagious, it's not. It, it's not a contagious, horrible disease. It's awesome. I'm, har I'm harmless, I don't bite hard. <laughs> oh yeah, I don't I'm bite much. And for those of you who think that we're freaks, we're not.